Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the uh, eight-game main slate we have here on uh, Wednesday, August 2. Uh, huge, huge night last night. A lot of high scoring. Um, hope everybody else did well. One of the slates <laughs> where uh, I did not read things very well um, and paid for it commensurately. So, um and we got a couple of spots right, but uh, for the most part, um, you know, pretty rough day for me. In any case, uh, we move on, right? Uh, we've got uh, eight more games. Um, we do have a split slate here today. Three different ones you can run if you so choose. We have early slate projections up, of course, um, and uh, certainly for the main slate here. And there's a short little two-game afternoon slate also. Uh, so a bunch of day baseball. And nice little eight-gamer here. Interesting tournament slate. Um, some offenses with some attackable spots. Some more good pitching for sure. Uh, and that's kind of the brief overview here. Probably want to stay off of a lot of guys down here in the super cheap range. Maybe some couple, or a couple rather, of um, you know pretty obvious spots. Right, Gonsolin gets Oakland, uh, who is terrible. Um, you know, we have a, uh, Slade Ciccone here making his debut, uh, against the Giants in San Francisco. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, in the mid range, some very attackable spots, certainly I might want to stay off of a couple of these guys, uh, but maybe an interesting tournament play here for Grayson, perhaps. Um, you know, if you've got the stomach to eat it against Toronto. Up top, we got Garrett Cole, Joe Ryan, Logan Webb, Kadai Senga, and McClanahan, uh, all above 9,000. Um, you know, we'll talk about these guys. Price adjusted, seems all right for most of them so far. I'm still bearish on Garrett Cole up here at 11,000. Um, you know, so we'll uh, we'll get into that. Same sort of deal with Logan Webb here a little bit. Uh, today might be the day where I just bite it with. Kodai Sanga, eat the ownership because he gets the Royals who are terrible. So um, everything is loaded to the site here, and let's just uh, let's get into the games um, and see if we can keep this relatively condensed, maybe hopefully under an hour here. Uh, we will see. Tampa and New York. Here's McClanahan. Here's Cole. 9300 for McClanahan. I like the price tag here, to be quite honest. Um, and if we're choosing between the two guys here, Cole at 10-8, McClanahan at 93. Uh, I prefer McClanahan, right? I think there's more relative upside at the price tag for McClanahan than there is for Cole um, in these respective matchups, right? McClanahan getting the Yankees over here, and even though they have Judge back, um, you know, they're still going to swing and miss a little bit, and they don't hit for a lot of average, right? They're a, a very sort of three true outcome type of team over here, hit for power, they walk. And, well, they don't strike out nearly as much because they've got so many right-handers over here. But still a couple of uh, very attackable spots. Um, you know, Stanton and, and Judge in particular. These guys strike out, right? Even though they hit for all the power in the world. Uh, Glaber, not, you know, 22% K rate or so, right? About, um, you know, team average for him. Um, still a pretty good hitter, of course. And if we're going to go after some McClanahan... You know, that's how we're going to want to do it. It's going to be with righties, obviously. We don't want any lefties. Uh, so, once again, no Anthony Rizzo. Um, they, who knows, with uh, with Donaldson still on the shelf, they might, may just have to throw Rizzo in there. Um, so he might be in there, but they're going to have, you know, eight righties otherwise. So uh, there is a little bit of upside here for sneaky Yankee stacks. I hate going after McClanahan generally. Because I really respect the arm. He's got a fantastic changeup, and he induces a hell of a lot of swing and miss to the right side. Good curveball, too, right? It's the four-seamer slider mix that kind of leaves it on the table uh, for him a little bit. Control can kind of elude him sometimes. 9% walk rate. It's not terrible, right? But it is slightly elevated for a, a pretty elite arm guy that, you know, came damn near... Um, to winning the Cy Young last season. 10% barrel rate is a little bit concerning here for McClanahan. He does get give up some hard contact, some loud contact, right? We see that 35% hard to the right-handers, just a, you know, buck 10, buck 15, ground ball to fly ball to the right side with a 20% line drive rate. 182 ISO allowed this season. 
despite the 28 percent you know raw strikeout rate against the right side he is a little bit attackable there uh so if you want to get to a couple of yankee sacks you can always play judge of course glaber down to 46 now it makes him more playable still prefer mcclanahan in this matchup but um, stanton at 47 it's it's an okay price tag even though he's going to strike out a lot here um DJ, you probably want to include him in any Yankee stacks because he doesn't really strike out, still makes a lot of contact, and he's going to hit a lot of ground balls. So upside-wise, you know, he's not going to hit the ball out all that often uh, against McClanahan. Um, but at 3,000 flat, he is a fine contact piece in the middle of the lineup if Judge Stanton uh, Glaber are getting on ahead of him. You know, DJ's in a, a fine sort of... Uh, production spot same thing with ikf and harrison bader probably we're gonna want to stay off volpe here uh same thing with either catcher um i think it's gonna be higgs i believe trevino's still up in any case um you know some a, a playable yankee stack can be found uh if you want to go that route and they're gonna be totally off the board i think they really should be for the most part like i said but um it's not completely crazy here on an eight gamer to go after a little bit of McClanahan but I'm gonna side with him here 9300 I like the price tag a little bit more and against left-handers this season right we uh, just showed this a minute ago um, still slightly attackable mostly with the batting average here they're hitting you know below league average split adjusted uh, they do create that's obviously because of the power and the walk rate uh, but they're not gonna steal bases right and they're gonna have to really circle um, and McClanahan is is pretty efficient for the most part, right? Really f efficient early in the count, 65% strike one, 34% chase. These are all great numbers here. Plate discipline up at 31% with in the CSW. It's all great. Um, we are looking for a little bit of negative regression just in the raw suppression, right? 3-0 ERA with expected pointing about a run higher or so, 83% strand rate, not sustainable. So that's how he could get picked apart a little bit. Um you know, maybe walk a guy and then give up a bomb or something. Very well within range here. I think it's a dangerous spot, certainly. But uh, at 9,300, I think there's a little bit of upside. I do kind of like the ownership here, too. Uh, we'll see where it sort of fleshes out by the end of the day as we get into lock here. Um, shouldn't be nearly as chaotic as it was yesterday, obviously. We should have you know, most lineups in at a reasonable time here. But um, I think uh, McClanahan could could perform a little bit uh he's been up and down this this season of course but i'm really attracted to the just a 200 batting average allowed to the right handers this year and a pretty big sample 370 hitters nearly uh face this season so um i think there's upside for him to suppress a pretty good bit here and approach some some really equitable strikeout stuff so uh gonna have to side with him here most often, even though the Yankee stack is in play. Garrett Cole at 10-8, I think he's still just overpriced. Um, now, you're paying for consistency. We've talked about this a couple of times now. He's been very consistent. He's gotten, for the most part, rid of the homer problem. He'll give up, you know, you know one every couple starts, um, which is much better than it used to be, right? He was uh, stone-locked to give up one pretty much every outing, at, at least one. Um, he's still a little susceptible, though, to underperforming with the strikeout stuff. And this is a difficult matchup. Um, now, if you kind of dig into all of Cole's results this year, he's taking apart all of the really bad teams. Um, you know, did most recently, Kansas City and Colorado. Seattle uh, was his last 30-point game before the Colorado outing. Um, you know, he's still got 22-25 in the tank pretty regularly. But whenever he gets a difficult matchup, he struggles a little. Um you know, for example, St. Louis, Texas, Boston this season, the Dodgers, he only put up 20, and he was 11,000. San Diego only put up 20, he was 11,500. One outing against Baltimore, uh, he put up a zero, right? Struck out just two in five innings, gave up five earned runs, right? Toronto just put up 20 points. In two starts against Tampa earlier this season, he's got 11 points and seven points, uh, fantasy points, that is, right? Five innings in both of those outings. In one of them, he gave up five earned, struck out six, but gave up the five earned, walked two guys. And then in the other one, he went five, gave up two earned, struck out just four, walked two guys, right? So um, very up and down, and 
for the most part, he's been good against bad teams when he should be good, and he's been marginal at best against better lineups, which is kind of expected. So that's kind of how I want to approach Garrett Cole for the most part. I think he's too popular in general. I, I like the strikeout stuff, obviously. I don't necessarily against Tampa, right? They're just an average strikeout team, slightly attackable sometimes for sure. Uh, but a 118 WRC plus, these guys will get on and they will steal bases. They hit for more average than a team like uh, the Yankees, for example, right? This is a full two and a half percent delta here, uh, you know, give or take. Don't walk as much, but a nine percent versus ten percent walk rate in aggregate is nothing really to write home about necessarily. But they have a higher OPS than the Yankees do split adjusted. They hit for the same amount of power and more hard contact. So um, I think the matchup, given the price tags here, is just flat out better for Shane McClanahan. Um, even though it's a dangerous spot, they're two respectable lineups. They have, you know, good hitters on both sides, of course. But 30% ownership for Cole as the most expensive guy in the day. I think this median projection at pushing 21 points is too high. And it actually started above 21, 21 and a half or so here in the early going this morning. And it's already ticking down. So, um, you know, I think it's just too high. The ownership is too much for me, uh, even though you know we do like the efficiency and the consistency with Cole this season. Um, love the plate discipline. It's not that necessarily, but he's also got a 260 ERA with expected pointing about a run higher and an unsustainable strain rate. So uh, at the particular price tag, or you know, um, I am going to probably come off of Garrett Cole or at least come in under. You know, building a ton of teams can't just totally fade the guy, but... Um, you know, if I got to choose between the two, it's McClanahan for me. Very little offense, of course, uh, outside of, you know, leverage stacks. Uh, I'd, I'd obviously prefer Tampa. They're more attainable price-wise um, than they have been recently. And, you know, I'd like to get more leverage on the field going after 30% ownership of Garrett Cole than just the 10 12% that we're seeing here on McClanahan so far. So that's kind of how I'd like to play it. I like Tampa a little bit. It's just pick them into betting markets right now. Um, and this ownership delta would not suggest that for Garrett Cole, especially given the price tag. I think it's um, a little out of whack here. Okay, let's move on. Baltimore, Toronto. Uh, Grayson Rodriguez, 7,200. Okay. He gets Toronto here. This is a difficult spot for him, man. Um now, he does he, he has whiffs, right? We can't really deny that with the 25% aggregate K rates to both sides. A little bit better with the really good change uh, against the left side. It's the four-seamer that we talked about that's really been eating him alive here. Not a lot of value out of this cutter either. So no real you know, rollover type of pitch, soft contact type of pitch. Certainly to the left side, right, as we see here, just inducing 6% soft contact. That's a problem. 41% uh, hard contact. That's a problem. Even though there's there's ground balls here to buck 50 to the lefties, ground ball to fly ball ratio, still giving up three homers per nine with a pushing 300 ISO. Um, you know, so that's how we want to go after him. But Toronto they just don't have any left-handers, man. They got Brandon Belt, Dalton Varsho, and Kevin Kiermeyer. Are they going to throw Kevin Biggio in the lineup? I mean, who knows? He stinks. And he's probably going to start, strike out a lot. Same thing with Varsho. Brandon Belt still has a 28% strikeout rate or something stupid this season. So, um, you know, there's some strikeouts here against those uh, those left-handers that can do the most damage. Now, of course, you know, Toronto is naturally far better against right-handers than they are against lefties, uh, power-wise, production-wise. Um you know, just a 22% strikeout rate. So that's how Grayson could struggle here a little bit. I do think the price tag is slightly intriguing, 7,200. Certainly the, the ownership slightly intriguing as well. But undoubtedly, this is a very difficult spot, and his numbers are terrible. So if you want to fade the guy, uh, you know, you're not going to get a, all that much of an argument from me. 10% walk rate, 10.5% barrel rate. Um, you know, five pitches that he can go to work with, but three of them, you know, really getting kind of taken apart here. So... Needs more, you know, down in the strike zone, ground ball type of stuff. He's got to stay down with this four-seamer, man. He's floating it, and um, this is how he's really getting beat up. Just getting this up in the strike zone. You know, Cutter is a pretty significant work in progress as of right now. Uh, should probably just focus on, you know, three pitches rather than a full five-pitch quiver and, um, you know, really dial in a lot of the values before you start getting crazy with it. He's a... Very high upside arm in the future, and we're going to be paying 10000 for this kid, uh, I mean, maybe even next year. But 
at the moment, you know, these numbers are horrible and he needs a lot of work. So I have no problem if you want to go ahead and, and stack the Blue Jays here and go after him. Um, at the price tag and the ownership for him, I think I'd probably rather side with him in tournaments, even though the these power numbers allowed are you know very concerning. I think he has a little bit of upside, sneaky upside at this price tag and could pop for 2025 here. Um, because I think he might be able to squeeze a win out of this and get some run support because the Orioles get Kikuchi on the other side. He's 7,800, and there's very little chance that I go after this. Now, he has some strikeout stuff too, but his numbers are you know, just as bad, if not worse, than Grayson's. And Kikuchi's been doing this in the bigs. You know, Grayson has, you know, he just made his debut earlier this season. So um, I think it's safe to say that Kikuchi is has really not fixed a lot of the problems that he was exhibiting last season. Hard contact is still a major problem. He is a fly ball lean type of guy instead of, or as opposed to Grayson, who is a ground ball lean, right? Buck 33 for Grayson, 095 for Kikuchi. Same hard contact rates. Homer rates are effectively the same, giving up the same amount of power for all intents and purposes with a 200 X ISO give or take. Um, with 25% strikeout rate. So if I got to choose, it's similar to the last game, right? Give me Grayson on the mound. He's 600 cheaper. He is a third of the ownership, uh, roughly 40% of the ownership. Um, the matchup is difficult for, for both of these teams, right? Uh, it's not like the that Baltimore is a... Um, you know, a pushover here, buck 12 WRC plus 10% walk rate, 21 and percent strikeout rate for them, buck 75 ISO, 34% hard. It's all really, really similar here. 260 batting average for both teams, right? OPS at 750. Baltimore is a little bit better as a matter of fact. So if I got to choose, it's not going to be with, with, with Kikuchi here. Um, I think you can get to offense in this game. Absolutely. If you want to stack both sides, I'd prefer Baltimore personally. Um, they are cheaper, right? And frankly, I think they're generally a a better offense. Um, and I I don't want to say I disrespect Kikuchi, but I I don't respect Kikuchi as much as I do respect Grayson to really start figuring it out here a little bit. Uh, and he's got the the bat of ball profile that I like a little bit more. Um, you know, I want to get to some right-handers over here. Mount Castle, Austin Hayes at their respective price tags, 36 and 3,300 are very attractive. Ramon Urias is 2,200. That's a kind of a steal price tag in the middle of the lineup there. Jordan Westberg, also very cheap at 29. The only guy you got to pay for, really, is Rutch at 5,000. Santander is still at 4,400. We like him from the right side. So uh, I think Baltimore is a very playable stack here. Um, just kind of in the mid-range in, in value and ownership, certainly. And if you want to play, if you can make a game stack happen, I think it's it's viable going after Grayson because, like I said, undoubtedly he's got some pretty bad numbers. Um, but I think Grayson can be in play here at super low ownership. No Kikuchi for me. I'm just going to target offense for the most part and maybe a little bit of Grayson. All right, let's move on to Minnesota and the Cardinals. Um, Joe Ryan at 10-1. I think this is okay. Uh, now, this is a little fishy here. Joe Ryan's got problems, man. Like, I love this kid. I love the fastball. I love the split. But he's got a very serious issue. He's only got those two pitches. And with the slider here, he's throwing it 14% of the time. So he has it. right? But he's given up three and a half outs to the field on this pitch alone. Um, he's, he's got whiffs, right? It still induces a little bit of swing and miss. But, man, he gives up a boatload of power here. 239 ISO allowed this season. Yeah, 34% K rate, that's cool. But 39% hard contact and 050 ground ball to fly ball. You can't get away with a 50 plus percent fly ball rate in this type of hard contact. That's translating to a full 2.3 homers per nine to the right-handers this season. He doesn't walk anybody, so it's pretty difficult to stack against him. He's a heavy fly ball pitcher. You generally don't want to stack against fly ballers. Uh, but you can homer hunt against Joe Ryan here, and they got some right-handers over here, in particular Nolan Arenado, Paul Goldschmidt, that can lift the baseball. They actually have slight ground ball leans in their uh, individual and respective batted ball profiles themselves. So uh, same thing with Wilson Contreras. These guys can lift the ball. Tyler O'Neill's at a playable 3,500. One-off pieces or short stacks of some right-handers getting a little bit of leverage on some Joe Ryan here. Uh, I think the price tag is probably a bit high 
for this particular matchup. It's a difficult strikeout spot, even though he's got 30% Ks in the tank. We're not really worried about that necessarily. It's the contact profile that really makes me balk here. Um, I think St. Louis is a very shrewd tournament stack here today. Um, I'd probably prefer to play them because of Goldschmidt's price at 5700 uh, probably prefer to play them as just a short stack or one-offs. Uh, but I, I do like Arenado. think this is a pretty decent spot here. Same thing with uh, either of the other righties I mentioned, Contreras and O'Neal. Uh, Jordan Walker is intriguing here. He'll probably you know, strike out a little bit in this matchup. Uh, but he's a heavy ground ball hitter. And that profiles obviously very well against Joe Ryan. Um, he gives a pop, man, to the right side. That's like a pretty serious concern. He's got to develop out this slider. If he does that, he'll be, you know, a, a top, there's certainly a top 10 arm in baseball. He probably already is. Um, and for DFS purposes, he'd probably be a top five if he really now, you know, d deals with this this slider value here. So, uh, or going forward, rather. So, um, I think the Cardinals are, are intriguing. I like Joe. Don't get me wrong. He's certainly, like, you can't fade this guy in tournaments. Uh, and at 15% ownership, I think it's it's playable. Um, not a lot of value or leverage necessarily that I want to squeeze out of these numbers. Um, the projection down here in the 15, 16, 17 point range seems okay for me. Um, you know, it, it, it looks okay. And same thing with the ownership. I don't really want to come in with 25% of my teams on Joe Ryan in this matchup necessarily. I think it's a dangerous spot. Um, you know, Cardinals still a very good offense, even though they you know, have underperformed on the mound this season and certainly in the win-loss column. Um, you know, still a really dangerous offense with some very good hitters over here. So a uh, difficult spot for Joe, I think. Um, and at 10000 might be a little bit expensive for me. Dakota Hudson, I'm just going to leave on the shelf. Uh, but I don't know. This is one of the spots where, like, a, a guy with very low upside, similar to... Um, similar to uh, Michaelis yesterday, you know, like... You can go after this team with you know, pretty much anybody <laughs> because they're awful. They strike out. Their plate discipline is terrible. Um, and they have, you know, sure, they've got upside if they can make contact. But all of these guys, they just strike out way, way, way too much. And it prevents them from just putting runners on base and being able to capitalize on some of this power, right? 183 ISO is nice, but you have to get guys on base. You cannot strike out at this kind of clip. Like, this is Detroit. Tigers bad from the last several seasons. It's awful. Um, they don't hit for average, and they just don't get on. When they do, they don't steal bases, so they don't create uh, all that efficiently. It's only when you get like super low strikeout guys, you know, like a Miles Michaelis or a Dakota Hudson, that they can make more contact. But they still got to actually do it. So that's mostly what takes me off of Dakota Hudson. It's just that the the contact rate here is too high at 80% for me. Um, he's always been a heavy ground ball guy. These numbers this year, uh, you know, far shorter sample because he spent a lot of time in the bullpen. Uh, really not a lot of work for him. But I don't know. At 7,700, I think the upside for him is a little bit capped. And, you know, even though there's strikeout stuff, he just doesn't have it in the tank. It's just a suppression spot, mostly. Um so, I don't know. I think both sides can be playable. I have to side with the Twins. I just can't get excited about playing a 15% strikeout guy at 7,700 in DFS. I just, I just can't do it. Um, you know, so, I, I got to side with the Twins and Eddie Julian, Max Kepler, Buxton, playable once again against a low strikeout guy. You know, anybody here in the middle of the Twins lineup, Correa is expensive at 4,600. I'd much rather play him today than uh, yesterday, for example, at the same price tag. But... Um, you know, still a kind of a fishy spot. So I think offense is absolutely in play. You can stack this game once again, you know, similar to the uh, the Baltimore-Toronto game. Um, I think that's fine if you want to approach it that way. Uh, but, you know, don't be surprised if you're smashing your head in the wall uh, later on today with the Twins. I mean, they're just a, an incredibly irritating offense. Um and they get torn apart by some pretty low upside and what I think are some pretty bad arms and like a, a Michaelis, for example. And Dakota Hudson it could very well perform to that level tonight. Um, 
I don't like the arsenal from him, even though it does keep him down in the strike zone. So it's just, uh, you know, heavy sinker guys are, uh, you know, this is a bad major league pitch, and it should not be thrown for the most part, uh, unless you're incredibly efficient with it. And for the most part, he's really not uh, Hudson. So offense, yeah, definitely. A uh, little bit of Joe Ryan, too, because fading a 30% K rate guy on any type of slate in any type of matchup is kind of dangerous. Um you know, so, uh, but mostly offense, but a little bit of Joe, too. All right, let's move on. White Sox, Texas. Uh, Dylan Cease, I'm going to pr- leave him off again. I just don't trust the guy, man. Uh, there's some times where we could jump on board and play him a little bit, um, but I'm not doing it against Texas. I still really, really respect the lineup, and I hate the walk right here against right-handers. I cannot do it. He gives up a, you know, buck 30 ground ball to fly ball, and they got a bolt boatload of fly ball hitters over here from the right side, notably Marcus Semien, Addy Garcia, Josh Young, Mitch Garver. Um, all these are power hitters and fly ball hitters, you know, from the right side. You know, they're going to walk a little bit, but, you know, then you got contact hitters from the left side, like Travis Jankowski and Nate Lowe in particular. Brad Miller has historical, you know, excellent numbers against right-handers, also a fly ball hitter. Um, you know, this is a dangerous matchup for Dylan Cease. I think 23% ownership seems out of control high to me. Uh, so I, I'm going to come in under on that, and I'll probably just end up Xing him. Um, I very rarely play guys against Texas, and Dylan Cease just does not fit that profile for me. This is a super dangerous lineup, even without Corey Seager. Uh, so I don't really want to deal with it. He might make me look like a jackass, but uh, and that happens sometimes. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of value that we can squeeze out of 8,400. In this particular matchup, certainly no value that we can squeeze out of 23-25% ownership on the guy in a bad matchup. Um, so I'm going to just come off, you know, just go elsewhere with Dylan Cease. I just don't like it. I hate the spot. I hate going after Texas. Dane Dunning at 6,100. Well, Andrew Heaney made me look like an idiot yesterday, uh, and he can do that. Dane Dunning, however, just does not have the same strikeout stuff. Um, so once again, you can go after and play the White Sox. Because most of their guys are right-handed heavy, and Dunning's best pitch is really the cutter. Now, he does have the two-seamer, which keeps right-handers off the board a little bit, too, right? Just a 103 ISO, 211, 211 excuse me, batting average allowed to the righties, and buck 60 ground ball to fly ball. A um, little, little bit more attackable with the left-handers, uh, notably like Dodgers types left-handers, um, in his last outing, Dunning, I think I believe it was his last outing, could have been the one before that. He got really taken apart by the Dodgers. But the White Sox obviously just don't have that same kind of upside. So, um, you know, it's a better matchup for him, certainly. And at 6,100, he can be in play, definitely. And down here in this low 6,000 range, 2.2 point per dollar at a 30 value score nearly is pretty attractive. Um but we're always worried about upside with Dane Dunning because he himself pitches to 83% contact with just a 16% strikeout rate. So um, he's efficient early in the count, doesn't walk guys and stays off the barrel, induces ground balls, right? So with a heavy ground ball hitting team over here in the White Sox that doesn't create, doesn't get on base and steal, that has to put him in play. Um, and of course, we saw, you know, what Andrew Heaney did to them last night, he struck out a, a lot of guys, but he still went seven innings and didn't give up, give up any production. So um, Dane Dunning still has seven innings in the tank here against this team because it's a very low upside offense. So I think both sides could be in play here. Mostly Texas offense for me against Dylan Cease because he's, you know, 25% owned or whatever. Um, you know, but maybe a little bit of Dane Dunning, too, at the price tag. I think there's upside there, and certainly in the matchup. I like the ownership, of course, a little bit better. But if you want to play some you know, fly ball hitters like a Luis Robert, right, that's fine from the right side. You could do that. I don't mind that at all. Or a lefty here or there if they have anybody in the lineup outside of Andrew Benintendi who has zero upside. Um, so a little bit of White Sox stuff, you know, but probably not a lot, um, you know, you, I really respect the sinker cutter combo here and slider too, keeping Dane Dunning really down in the strike zone. And I don't really like the bat of ball matchup. So for the most part, just Texas, a little bit of Dunning and I'm going to, you know, minimize the exposure I've got on the white Sox. Okay. Reds and the Cubs, Brandon Williamson, man, Cubs uh, really took it to Ben Lively last night. Eh? Um, 
Williamson here at 6,300, well, he's not going to throw a pass to anybody, so I think he can go right back to the Cubs. They're going to be very popular here tonight, and they really should be, I think. He's given up production in spades, not so much in batting average, right, to the right-handers, but a 350 Woba buoyed a little bit by a 10% walk rate, 246 ISO, that's really the super attackable figure, 19% strikeout rate, 1.8 homers per nine with fly balls, right? 075 ground ball to fly ball, 22% line drive rate. Um, the walk rate and the barrel rate, the walk rate is at 10% in aggregate, barrels at 9%. That's certainly attackable. So if you want to go after the Cubs, yeah, by all means, I got no problems here. They're very well priced. Um, this is a... You know, these pieces here are pretty good cash game plays here today, I think. And they're very playable in tournaments as well. Might want to get a little different because of their ownership. But, um, you know, Nico at 46, that's pretty underpriced for this matchup. Same thing with, say, Suzuki. And even Ian Happ from the right side a little bit, even though the left side is his better side. At 3,300, that's fine. Dansby at 44, I like this. Jan Gomes you could play. Chris Morrell at 4,800. And the seven hole is kind of stiff. But, you know, that's a pretty decent tournament play here. Etc. Etc. You can play Jamer, uh, who will be in um, very likely in the lineup since they DFA'd. Uh, who was it? Um, somebody. The name is escaping me at the moment. Trey Mancini uh, yesterday. So Jamer's going to get a lot of work at first base. He's 4,200 though, and down in the eight hole, uh, a lot of his value this season from hitting in the three hole with the Nationals uh, is totally gone at that price tag. But he's in play in stacks, and Nick Madrigal doesn't strike out is a pest down at the bottom of the lineup. So you play literally every single guy in the list here, including a Bellinger if you want to do that. Not my favorite, but uh, go ahead. They may even give him a day off tonight. So every single one of the Cubs absolutely in play once again against Brandon Williamson. Um, really just not a lot of upside for him, even at this price tag in this matchup. Would rather play Dane Dunning, for example. 6,800 on the mound for Drew Smiley. Like, he's in play but I hate playing Drew Smiley, man. Um, I like going after him because I don't respect the sinker. And this is, you know, he's throwing a lot more of the cutter now, so that's good. And he's keeping right-handers at bay a little bit better now. Um, isn't relying just solely on the curveball and the swing and miss there. But he's still just throwing 41% of a, of a two-seamer here. And against right-handers, this is a terrible pitch. I mean, I say this literally every day. Um I don't want to go after the Reds necessarily at this price tag. I think some of the upside for him is kind of priced in. Now, would I be shocked to see 18, 20 points out of him? Yeah, probably not, because some guys over here, like an Ellie De La Cruz in particular, Matt McClain, right? These guys are going to strike out a little bit, still from the right side. But um, this is a dangerous matchup. Smiley at 78% contact. And, you know, a lot of fly balls here, 200 ISO to the right side, is that's attackable, man. Uh, 7, 070 ground ball to fly ball, 23% line drive rate. I want to try and get to some off-the-board red stacks if I can. I think going to get some Smiley at 6,800, like he's in play at sub-10% ownership. But I think the upside is capped, so I'd like to play some reds here. Um, I just don't like the price tags, obviously, right? Ellie's still 61. I love Nick Senzel at 32, and I really like Spencer Steer at 43. Also, CES will be in there instead of Joey Votto tonight at 3,000 flat. But they're going to have nine righties in the lineup. Um, and that's a lot of power that Smiley's given up here. 242 ex uh, batting average, rather, against you right-handers isn't great. Would like that a little bit higher. But the power number, I think you can really chase it at Wrigley here um, and go after some Smiley. So I think it's viable to play both sides. I'm going to side with the Reds in tournaments um, because I think they're a, a far, far higher upside stack uh, than... You know, taking the, the the risk here with Drew Smiley, it's a little fishy for me personally. So uh, that's how I'm going to target it. You know, mostly offense in this game for me. All right, let's move on to the Mets and the Royals. Uh, could I say 9,500? All right, fine. Uh, the walk rate is still a problem here for me. Um, obviously, at 12 percent, he walked another three guys in his last start. Um, you know, if if a guy walks three batters in a start every so often, and it's occasional, fine, but I can't do it with Sanko when he does it every damn outing. So that's still just what takes me off, but I think the matchup here is too good. 9500 I think the price is okay for the matchup. Is there a lot of value that we could squeeze out of this? Um, 
Uh, not necessarily in general because he elevates his pitch count. You still need him to go six innings or more up at this price. And when he walks the whole country, he just doesn't do that. So what what takes me off, obviously, is, is higher ownership. I love playing him, or I would love playing him more, I should say, at very low ownership. Um, but he's not going to see that today because of the matchup. And I think it's warranted. Uh, so if you want to come in over the field here in Kodai Senga, I think this is okay. Uh, because the Royals, they're, they're going to strike out a crap load here tonight. Um, 30 to 29% strikeout rate, really to both sides. And he's dialing in the walk rate a little bit better. The control is a little bit better, right? This was 14, 15% earlier in the season. It's all the way down to 12%. Um, I mean, not like that's a huge deal because it's still 12% and kind of egregious, but... Uh, it's better than it was, right? Still induces ground balls with a lot of whiffs here. Um, so I think it's okay. If you want to play, like, some hedge pieces, see if uh, Freddie Fermin is in the lineup. He's got really good numbers against right-handers this season. You could play Bobby Witt, too, sure. And you could play Salvi, but they're at their normal price tags, and this is a down matchup. So, um, you know, from the left side, maybe, like, a, I don't know, a Kyle Isbell. Michael Massey is cheap still, but, you know, these guys are going to strike out. So, um, you know, not my favorite play in any of the Royals. I'd probably rather just get to Senga. It's probably going to bite me in the ass, um, you know, playing him at hot, at an expensive price tag and a higher ownership figure. But uh, so it goes. Um, Got to play him, I think, here tonight. Matchup's just too good. Cole Reagans is on the mound for the Royals. He's not in the DK player pool because they're a circus act. Uh, scratch that. They actually did just update it. Um, so I apologize to DraftKings. He's 6,600. And I am still just probably not going to play him. Um, he doesn't have a hell of a lot of strikeout upside against the Mets. We do have numbers, of course, so that's good. But he's 6,600. We won't have projections just yet since he was just added. Um, how we really want to attack Cole Reagans historically, it's just been with righties, even though he's been a little bit better. This sample is just too short this year. Um, just a bullpen guy, but he has four pitches, right? Four seamer cutter, uh, curveball change can induce some swing and miss and keep right handers off the board a little bit with the cutter change. Um, and does induce, like I said, some unique swing and miss with the curveball here against righty. So that's why we see a slightly elevated strikeout rate to the right side, 25% here. Uh, but for the most part, still pretty attackable with right handers. That's Pete Alonzo territory of course it did get starling Marte back uh frankie alvarez is an okay spot here probably going to strike out a little bit but he's a fine 3900 catcher piece if you want to do that frankie lindor of course at 51 from the right side is fine too um so met stacks are a little bit in play i'm going to probably come in under on the mets though today um it's not that i you know want to play or respect cole reagan's all that much necessarily it's mostly because i think they're probably going to be a little bit popular for my liking and i'd rather play some other teams that are just flat out better offenses than the Mets, even though they've been, uh, you know, better recently. But I do like PD at 52, of course. And, you know, like a, a Frankie Alvarez, Starling Marte, he's really the only one that gets on base and steals, right? Uh, you can play a Mark Vientos at third base now. Um, that eligibility is is nice. So you don't have to just, like, eat the Brett Beatty or, um, you know, pick and choose between Vientos and, and Pete Alonso, for example. Um so this is a playable stack are the Mets, but I think the, they might be a little bit popular for my liking here today. You can get different with them, sure, like playing Vientos or a Danny Mendick down at the bottom of the lineup. That's fine um, to mix in those guys here against Cole Reagan. It's just not a ton of strikeout at whiff upside to really battle here, but he could survive for like four or five innings. Um, you know, if they leave him in as a true starter, I think he's stretched out a little bit. So he might only get three or four, but... Um, you know, that's really why he's not in play necessarily for me at 6,600. So Mets, yeah, sure, but could I say it definitely? Very little of the Royals here outside of leverage pieces. Okay, Arizona-San Francisco, um, we got a debut here. Uh, Slade Ciccone is coming up from Reno to go for the D-backs. He's a starter. He's stretched out, but, man, he's got really, really bad numbers in Reno. Now, that's in the PCL, right, and that is a launching pad. Uh, in Reno. So we have to take the minor league numbers here with a grain of salt, but he's got really terrible splits. Um, pretty much to both sides. Super, super attackable. Uh, ownership wise, the, the Giants are not popping here because this game is in San Francisco. Same thing with projections. Not so much in value score either for the Giants, but um, 
you know, this kid, I believe, is just a three-pitch guy. He might have a fourth in there. Uh, and I think it's super attackable. So I want to go after a little bit of Sacconi here. Um, probably just short stacks because I hate playing 60-degree weather in San Francisco in a freaking night game. I just can't stand it. Um, but I think this is a fine spot for both lefties and righties. He's very attackable. He's actually got worse numbers against right-handers. Um, so that's going to be the, the like the four-seamer slider type of mix here without just a, a good swing and miss pitch uh, against right-handers. But again, we got to you know be careful with the PCL numbers. The results are just uh, super, super inflated in that league. Um, nevertheless, I mean, contact profiles you can absolutely attack. And this kid's making his debut against a pretty respectable lineup still so far. Um, and they can make, you know, below average and I, I suppose young arms really pay. So some good hitters over here, Lamont Wade, Michael Conforto, Jock Peterson, notably from the left side, JD Davis though, at 41, I think this is okay. Um, you know, a lot of power and, and ISO, he's got like a 250 ISO allowed to right-handers does Sacconi. So you can play some JD Davis. Um, he'll give up some fly balls with Sacconi as well. So that, that will match up well with JD Davis's high ground ball profile. And really, anybody down at the bottom of the lineup would like to stick because, you know, this is a game in San Francisco and, uh, you know, they're the home team here. Would like to stick to the top, you know, third, top half when I'm getting to San Francisco. But a piece here or there, they did just pick up A.J. Pollock. They have Luis Matos, uh, Patty Bailey from the right side, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Giants are in play here. I think they're an intriguing late game or sort of late night stack. Um, going after a, guy, a kid making his debut. So no Sacconi for me. He's 6,500. Um, if you want to like take a super punt on him at 5% ownership and, and, and go after some strikeout upside for the giant. I mean, sure. But, uh, you know, very little exposures, probably none for me. 9,800 on the mound for Logan Webb and the giants or for the giants and Logan Webb, I should say. Um, yeah, this is a tough spot. I hate going after Arizona. I like Logan Webb, right? 25% Ks, really to both sides. Doesn't walk anybody, doesn't get barreled. And he gives up you know, very few fly balls here. 24% fly ball rate in aggregate is elite. That's a 2.5 ground ball to fly ball ratio with a very low line drive rate, too. We can stomach the hard contact at 37% against lefties because he's getting so many ground balls there. 260, um, not really a, a big concern. It's more so been right-handers this year in terms of batting average that have been getting to him a little bit. Um, I think we've got some positive regression coming for Logan Webb. Is this a matchup where I really want to target that? Generally, no. You know, I really, really respect Arizona. Um, you guys know this from me by now. And I think it's a tough spot for him in general. At 9,800, I think some of the upside is is kind of priced out for us and they're priced into this price tag and we don't really get a ton of value here necessarily. Uh, I think it's okay to play him. Certainly you can play him in all formats, you know, down to single entry if you even, um, you know, want to do that because the game is, um, you know, obviously in San Francisco, right? In 60 degree weather. Sure. Go ahead. And he induces a lot of ground balls. He's had two outings against, Arizona this season went seven innings in both of them. Uh, the strikeout stuff, et cetera, is, you know, a little lacking naturally because Arizona's only going to strike out at a 20% clip against right-handers in general. Uh, and they'll create a little bit. So this is a tough spot. Um, but I think he's in play. It, it's not my favorite at 25% ownership. I In multi-entry stuff, I'd probably just come in a little bit under that, I would assume. Um, and that's mostly because of the price tag. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lukewarm on Logan Webb here a little bit, uh, but I think he's certainly in play. Um, it's mostly just my bias. I hate, hate, hate going after Arizona. So it's kind of how I'd like to play this game. Um, you know, mostly Giants offense here for me and a little bit of Logan Webb, but uh, right off kind of otherwise. Um, you know, always get exposure to Corbin Carroll, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, last game here, Oakland and the Dodgers. Um, Tony Gonsolin going for the Dodgers. We'll get to him in a sec. Hogan Harris, we can get through this pretty quickly. No, thank you. Absolutely not. 20% strikeout rate, 23% chase rate, and a 10% walk rate. Um, you just can't do it with a sub-60% strike one. Now, he's been okay in some, some outings here, but this is the Dodgers. We're not going to do this. Um, this is one guy down here I'm certainly not taking a punt on. Uh, I rarely play... 
guys against the Dodgers anyway, and when I do, it's guys that have velo and that they and have chase. Um, and Hogan Harris is a kind of a soft toss and lefty here. Uh, has an okay four seamer and an okay changeup, so he could keep some of these right handers at bay a little bit, but he's still just not going to throw it past them, and he gives up some fly balls. He's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy here. Um, that's a dangerous spot against the Dodgers, who pretty much all of them lift the baseball. Now, their lineup is garbage, okay? <laughs> this is still the Dodgers. Outside of the top four guys, Mookie, Freddie, uh, Will Smith, and you know Max Muncy's generally in the five hole, but um, you know this is not a very good list here. Like, J.D. Martinez is out. Will Smith has really kind of underperformed quite a bit here in his second season. Um, they just picked up a Med Rosario. Like, what are we doing with this? Um, you know, like, the Med Rosario is not a four-hole hitter. I know he's in there just because J.D. is hurt. But, like, he's a contact hitter, and that's fine to drive in Mookie, Freddie, Will Smith up top, who are also, you know, very, clearly the, the highest upside guys. Um, you know, but he is not a four-hole hitter. For, and he's doing it for the Dodgers. Chris Taylor stinks, strikes out a, a crap load, even though he's got you know, high power upside sometimes, but the strikeouts really bite him. Um, same thing with Max Muncy uh, in there in the middle of the lineup. And like, he's been awful against left-handers, even though some of the power is still there. Historically, he's been far better, but de- dealing with the injuries this season, um, you know, really been leaving it on the table for him. Then you've got Outman, Kike Hernandez has been dreadful this season in Boston before he came back, and Miggy Rojas doesn't have any upside himself. So this is kind of a, a bad lineup um, at the moment. And outside of Mookie, Freddie, and Will Smith, and, and some Max Muncy, Chris Taylor a little bit, like, I don't want to play any of these other guys, you know what I mean? So um, I think the Dodgers may also be a little bit popular here tonight for the upside that they offer collectively. You know, outside of the three guys, you know, sure, you can mix in you know, two more pieces because if they get to Hogan Harris and the Oakland bullpen, like, the Dodgers are still better than all of these guys. Let's let's be clear about that. But this is still an attackable lineup, and at, you know, they're going to be the most popular team today. And I'm not sure they should be um, with five of these guys, four of these guys at least in this lineup. They probably don't want to play, and there are better plays at their respective positions from other teams. So, uh, I don't know. That's probably the bearish, the most bearish take I've had on the Dodgers all season, probably in the last, like, five years, to be honest. Um, you know, but ownership-wise, they might be a little too popular to get to the guys that you really want to play because you don't want to play anybody else. Uh, Tony Gonsolin at 7,500, yeah, like, we, this is an upside spot for him. Um, even though he's only striking out 20% of guys, he's still super efficient early in the count. Right, strike one at 67%, 31% chase is still good because of the split value that's increasing a little bit as we get uh, more starts for him into the season. He's getting a little bit more comfortable now. Still having a little bit of uh, trouble with the control here and getting take apart in, in power to the left hand left handers notably um, at a 175 eye. So it's not a horrible figure necessarily, but 39% hard contact and a lot of fly balls right, to the left-handers, that's a concern. So if you want to get off and leverage some of Tony, the Tony Gonsolin 25% ownership here, I don't have a problem with that, right? Of course, Seth Brown again at 3,400. You're going to play him every day. Um, and all of these guys, J.J. Blade, they did trade Jace Peterson. He's over with Arizona now. Um, so a third, cheap third base play is not, you know, really there for you. Um but they do still have like a Tony Kemp, Tyler Soderstrom, right? Cody Thomas. They got a boatload of lefties here still. Uh, and Zach Yella from the right side. You can still play that because Gonsolin is not striking out any right-handers whatsoever at just 17%. Um, so still some attackability here for Gonsolin. I wouldn't get super crazy with it necessarily, even though this is a very good matchup against Oakland. Still striking out at a 25% aggregate clip and only hitting for a 215 batting average. That's mostly where it's attackable here. No power, no hard contact, right? Um, you know, super poor offense, obviously. So they're very similar spots here for Kodai Senga and Tony Gonsolin tonight. Um, but Tony Gonsolin's, you know, I got to side with him if I got to choose between those two guys because he's 2,000 cheaper, right? But very similar spots getting the two worst offenses in baseball here. Um, so, yeah, give me Gonsolin and some Dodgers for sure because fading the Dodgers pretty much ever when they get a good matchup is a really bad idea. Um, you know, but for the most part, I think I might come in under on the offensive pieces there. You know, Freddie and, and Mookie at 64 and 6,200 are not cheap, man. And a 5,600 catcher piece, even on an eight-game slate, is not 
it's still not the easiest to get to. Uh, so that's kind of how I'd like to play this late game here. Uh, all right, that's it. So let's go over. We're frozen in the sheet. There we go. Uh, quick review here, and we'll get out of here. Tampa and New York, pitching mostly, of course, because, you know, this is McClanahan and Garrett Cole. Uh, but if you want to leverage some some rays against Cole, uh, you always have my um, my approval there. You know, not like you need it, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to argue with you going after Garrett Cole. Uh, Tampa has had very good results against him in the past. So, um, you know, this is a dangerous spot for him at, at 10-8. Even though he's got the upside, I think the ownership is just too high for me. Um, even though, I, yeah, I like the projections and, you know, all that jazz. Uh, it's just a bit high for me. I'd prefer McClanahan on the other side at 93. Um, but a Yankee stack, you know, is playable going after McClanahan. He's giving up a little bit of pop to the righties. Baltimore and Toronto. Grayson is in play a little bit for me at 7,200. Not much, but, um, you know, he is in play. Certainly some Baltimore. I want to play some right-handers here against Kikuchi. I think he's dreadful. Uh, so none of the, whatever, 68 or 7,800 Kikuchi for me. A little bit of Toronto, sure. And game stack certainly in play if you want to go after the really bad numbers for Grayson. Minnesota St. Louis. Joe Ryan, yeah, fading a 30% K rate guy is dangerous, uh, even in a bad matchup. But I think St. Louis is a really, really intriguing tournament stack here tonight. Nobody's going to be playing them. Um, and this is a dangerous spot. Joe Ryan gives up a lot of power to right-handers. It's not all that regular. It's mostly homers. So you're kind of homer hunting. Um, that's why I prefer short stacks. But uh, I think Aaron Otto and you know, maybe even a Goldschmidt, Wilson Contreras, Tyler O'Neill type plays are, are really intriguing. Uh, Jordan Walker, too. But I like some Joe Ryan as well. Even at 10-1, um, he has to be in play just due to the, the upside for him. Uh, Minnesota definitely against Dakota Hudson. But, man, this offense just sucks. They're so bad. I don't think it's horrible if you land on a Dakota Hudson. But um, I think he's a bit expensive for my taste. I'd rather pivot it elsewhere. Um, you know, maybe a, probably a little bit cheaper. Probably to Grayson is, is who I'd rather play. Uh, but he is in play if you land on it because Minnesota is just garbage. Um, White Sox, Texas, no Dylan Cease for me. I'm just going to leave him off. I don't think there's a lot of value we can squeeze out of the respective uh, price tag and ownership figures. Um, Dane Dunning is not necessarily the case, even though you know the strikeout upside for Dylan Cease is, is far, far higher for Dunning uh, than for Dunning. Um, but... Dunning is 6100 you know, $2,300 is a pretty big savings there. And some Texas, because I'll probably, you know, if I'm fading Dylan Cease, may as well play Texas on the other side, right? A couple White Sox pieces are in play because of the contact rate for Dunning, but, you know, not much for me necessarily. Cincy and the Cubs, I like Cincy. I obviously like the Cubs, but I, I like a game stack here if you can make this happen price-wise. Um, and I think you might be able to. There's some cheap pieces. You can get cheap with, like, a Gonsolin and a Grayson team or something like that, or even a Dunning or whatever. Uh, you can make it happen here. Going after some Drew Smiley, I think it's very much in play. Wouldn't be shocked if he pops for 20, but, um, you know, I think I'd prefer and, and side with the Reds here. And Cubs definitely going after Brandon Williamson. Righties mostly, but, um, you know, stacks are very much in play still. Mets and KC. Could I Senga? Yeah. Uh, all right. Fine. Uh, no Cole Reagans here. Um, I don't have him in the sheet because at the time uh, he wasn't in the player pool, but he is there at 6,600. 600. Um, not in play for me. Met certainly, but I'm going to come in under because I think their ownership is going to be a little bit too high. I do kind of respect the arsenal a little bit for Cole Reagans. Not that it's all that efficient, but, um, I'm not super bullish on the Mets offense in general. Arizona and San Francisco, mostly, uh, the Giants here for me. Logan Webb. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Whatever. No Slade, uh, for me here tonight. Um, I'm going to stack the Giants and probably feel okay with it with some short stacks, preferably because it's in San Francisco. It's 60 degrees. Um, you know, it, and it's still a pretty frustrating offense, right? But mostly the Giants here for me. A little bit of uh, Arizona, maybe just like late slate plays or something. Oakland and the Dodgers, very little. Um, uh, I mean, no Hogan Harris, absolutely. Not for me. Um, Tony Gonsolin, yeah, we're going to play this. And, uh, you know, some Oakland, sure, because I'm going to have a lot of Gonsolin. I. I anticipate. So, um, you know, I'm going to want to hedge that with a, you know, it's Seth Brown um, or Cody Thomas, Tyler Soderstrom, something like that. JJ Blade, I think is fine as well going after some Gonsolin. Um, so that's kind of how I want to play it tonight. Uh, once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as we push them throughout the day. And, and good luck to everybody if you're playing the early or the main slate uh, here on Tuesday.